I don't think the Lord could have given me a more beautiful start to what I want to say. That was so lovely. What I want to say tonight is very simple. There is nothing profound about it. I just want to say it is wonderful to be part of the family of God. And to sit and see the beauty that was portrayed. And to belong to the family that can portray the beauty of Jesus as you have just seen in song and in art. It is a privilege to belong to the family of God. I've never been in the southern hemisphere of the world. I've traveled extensively in the northern hemisphere. And when I got on the plane and came to New Zealand, I came feeling a long way from home. And as I walked into the campground, I went over to the registration office and the first person that I met, and I've never been in this part of the world before, was an old friend from Newbold College. <laughs> it's wonderful <laughs> to belong to the family of God. The first time I ever went over to the United States, I went and stayed with relatives in New York who were not Adventists. And on the Sabbath morning, they took me to church and they just knew of a nearby Seventh-day Adventist church. It was just random, just one they happened to drive by and so they just took me. And I went and sat in that church during Sabbath school, made very welcome but knowing no one. And then the divine service came and the preacher walked onto the platform. He sat down, he looked across the congregation and he suddenly started looking at me and I was smiling at him. He leant forward in his chair on the platform and he was sort of doing this sort of thing. And then finally he said, Dalbert, is that you? It was me. <laughs> a random church. No indication before that I would be in that church. But there was a friend again from Newbold College. It is wonderful to belong to the family of God. To be united in the church. To be united in the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to be part of that family. It is a deep and a glorious privilege. I am a long way from home. I'm a long way from the arms of my wife that I love deeply. And yet, being with you, I believe I'm home. Tonight, it's very simple. The best place to be is with the family of God. The best place to be is with the church that loves the Lord. The most exciting place to be on the face of this earth is to be with the people that have that inexpressible joy, that understand worthy is the Lamb that was slain, that understand the possibilities that there are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is in that wonder and in the awe of that beauty of belonging to the family of God, I'd like to share some thoughts with you this evening. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21, it says this, To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I was thinking about this passage when suddenly something began to just lighten in my mind 
and I bang, began to find myself getting very excited. To him be the glory in the church. Suddenly I began to think about God of glory, the one that revealed himself, especially in the Old Testament, the one that revealed himself in great Shekinah glory, the one who came down on mountains and mountains shook, the one that was the glorious presence and revealed himself as the mighty God. Suddenly in the New Testament, after the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God is revealing his glory not by shaking mountains, not by coming down with Shekinah glory on the mercy seat of the sanctuary, but God is revealing his glory in the church. He's revealing his glory in the family of God. And I believe that what God is saying to us tonight that it is the most exciting and the most wonderful thing to belong to the family of God, not just because of the friendship, not just because of the love, not just because of the support that we can have together, but because God can reveal his true glory, not by the great dazzling display of light, but through the glory that's in the hearts of the people that love him in the church. It's wonderful to belong to the family of God. For in the church, God has chosen to reveal his true glory. His glory is might. His glory is almightiness. His glory is light. But his greatest glory is the love of the Lord in the people of God. It is wonderful to belong to the family of God. Some years ago, I was standing in a football ground on Sabbath. Now I'm in trouble. <laughs> it was the summer season and the football season was over. And the, these evangelical Christians had hired this football ground for a day of Christian festival. And we Adventists, we went along to join them in the afternoon of that Sabbath. It was a summer, and we stayed there, and the music was marvellous, and the singing was marvellous, and the love of God that was being displayed from the platform was marvellous. And we stayed there right through the day till the end of the day, when I had one of those most beautiful experiences in my life. What happened was, was very simply this. The sun started to set. And for once in the UK, we had the most beautiful, glorious sunset. There were beautiful colours. Colours not to be beaten. It was incredible. And as the sun was beginning to set, the ground and the football ground and the stadium in which we were gradually got darker and darker and darker. And so there you had this dazzling display of the grandeur of God's beautiful creation. But the stadium itself was in darkness. The people were standing in darkness. The preacher on the platform in the middle of the football pitch kept preaching. And gradually it got so dark that they put the lights on only on the preacher in the middle of the football field. The preacher came to his climax. The golden colours were beginning to fade, but they were still there. And he began to make an appeal for men and women to come and join the family of God to come in the name of Jesus, accepting the glories that Jesus showed us on the cross, and come and be part of the family of God. Out of the stadium, you could see in the darkness figures moving. You couldn't see who they were. You couldn't tell whether they were young or whether they were old. You couldn't tell the color of the clothes or the color of the skin. 
You just saw these shadowy figures. But the preacher on the platform kept saying, Come, come and join the family of God. And the people came out. And as they came out of the shadows, they moved into the semi-light. And then before long, there were thousands of people walking across that football pitch, walking from the shadows into the light. Above the sky was still golden. But as the people walked toward that central podium, they were walking into the light. They had come out of the darkness into the light. I said my thoughts would be very simple tonight. But for me, that's what the privilege is of belonging to the family of God. To belong to the family of God, we have come out of the darkness into the glory of the Lord and into the glorious light of his saving power and his saving ministry. And to stand and to be able to sing about those things with the family of God. To begin to pray about those things with the family of God. To begin to express those things with the family of God. To be able to talk about these things together. And to look at the beautiful things that we've looked at tonight. It is wonderful to belong to the family of God. United in the church, the body of Christ. Paul says in Ephesians 3 in verse 10 these words. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to rulers and authorities in heavenly realms according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is stunning. When you belong to the family of God, God is revealing his glory through the family. But Paul is now saying something that is so stunning, it's almost too much to believe. Paul is saying that in the family of God, the wisdom of God is revealed not just to the family, But the wisdom of God is revealed to the rulers and to the authorities in heavenly places. Paul does not make it clear whether he is talking about heavenly places and authorities as he does in other places where he is referring to those that are against God. But I suspect that Paul is now talking about the worlds that look upon this world. The Hubble telescope recently looked at a point in the sky the size of a grain of sand. And as it looked at this point, they counted the number of worlds in that one tiny grain of sand bit of sky. Then they extrapolated that, and they've come to the conclusion that there are at least 200 to 225 billion galaxies out there in space and they believe it could go much higher than that as they keep counting 200 to 225 billion galaxies out there out there are the rulers and the authorities of heavenly realms and Paul is actually saying in the family of God the wisdom of God is revealed to this vast order of existence, so wonderful and so glorious. And it is through the family of God on earth, the people of God, the church of God, united in the church, that God is revealing his wisdom to the rest of the universe. My friends, if that does not blow your mind, I don't know what will. The thought that God is revealing his wisdom through us and through the way that we relate together, the way that we talk together, the way that we worship together, the way that we praise together, the way that we love together, the Lord is showing his true nature to the vast universe. It's wonderful to belong 
to the family of God. For the glory of the Lord is to be revealed through the family of God. The wisdom of the Lord is to be revealed through the family of God. Paul said to Timothy in chapter 3 and verse 15, these words, and just let me find it. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Paul says this. He speaks initially, if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. The family of God, God has chosen them to be the sanctuary of his glory. The family of God, God has chosen them to be the sanctuary of his wisdom. The family of God, he has chosen them to be the pillars and the foundations for his truth. It's wonderful to be part of the family of God that love the great truths of God and glory in these truths and order their lives around these truths so that these truths bring inexpressible and glorious joy through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. To belong to the family of God, the glory, the wisdom and the wonderful truths is a glorious and a wonderful privilege. Consider the truths just for a moment. To do this, I'd like to take you to Revelation chapter 14. And in Revelation chapter 14, we have one of the most famous passages possibly in the Adventist world. I remind you of verse 6 and then verse 7. Then I saw another angel flying in mid-air, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And he said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of waters." If I understand the scriptures correctly, then it seems to me that the church who will be preparing the world for the coming of Jesus will be the church that loves this message. The family of God who is living and preparing for the glorious coming of Jesus will not only thrill to the revelation of the glory of God in its midst, will not only re uh, thrill to the glorious wisdom of God in its midst, but it will also thrill to the wonderful truths entrusted to it, to the glory of God. Let me explain. Revelation chapter 14 the primary thing that this message is saying, this message to the world, I suggest, is the eternal and glorious gospel. The family of God, who love the truth of God, will be alive with the glorious and wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Over in Texas, some years ago, there was a young man who uh, was taken to court and tried and condemned to death. This young man had been sitting at a table with another young man playing cards. Suddenly he was losing the game. And in anger, he suddenly turned over the table, drew out a gun and shot dead his uh, uh, partner, playing those cards. They arrested him, they took him to court, they uh, examined him, and finally they passed the death sentence upon him. And he was now in death row in the prison waiting for his execution. His mother, meanwhile, 
wrote a petition to the governor of the state. She got several thousand people to sign this petition. And then finally, this petition came before the governor, and it said something like this. Dear governor, my son is guilty, but he has never been in trouble with the law before. Please have mercy on my son. The governor looked at it. I don't know whether he had the right or not. I don't know the technicalities. But according to the newspaper report, the governor turned that piece of paper over with thousands of signatures. And on the back of all those signatures, he wrote, Pardon granted. Now the next thing I don't understand. I have no idea why he did this. Whether the governor was a clergyman, I don't know. But he went to the prison to give this pardon to the young man himself personally. But he dressed up in clergyman's robes. And he went into the prison, he went down to the cell, and when he got down to the cell, he approached the cell, and the cell door was opened by the prison staff, and he began to walk into the cell when the young man just took one look at him and said, Get out of here. He started to speak, the governor, but, but, and the young man just would not listen. He said, get out of here. But, but, young man, young man, listen to me. And the governor was trying to tell him that in his pocket there was the free pardon. But the young man suddenly got violent, and he lifted up his fists, and he said to the governor, if you don't get out of here, I'm going to throw you out of here. The governor turned round, and he walked away. The door closed. And the governor left the prison with the pardon still in his pocket. One of the prison officials came along, smiling, went to the cell, expecting to see a joyful young man. But there was a young man seething with anger. And the prison official said, but didn't you know? Didn't I know what? Didn't you know that was the governor of the state? No, I didn't know it was the governor of the state. But he came with your pardon. And the young man suddenly, oh no, I just didn't know. And he quickly wrote a note to the governor of the state and he apologized saying, I didn't know who you were. And when the uh, uh, envelope came onto the desk of the governor, according to the newspaper report, the governor opened it, he read it, he turned the paper over and he wrote on the back, pardon denied. That young man, ten days later, was taken to the electric chair. They strapped him in the chair, and then they said to him, do you have anything final to say? And he said yes. And the words I read in the newspaper report ring in my ears today. He said, Tell the young people of America, I am not dying today because I'm a, a murderer. I'm dying today because I rejected free pardon. My friends, I believe with a passion that nobody is ever going to be eternally lost because they're a sinner. I repeat it. I believe with a passion no one is going to be eternally lost because they're a sinner. The only way that you can be lost eternally because in sin you rejected the free pardon. When Jesus died on the cross, Christ won the pardon for the whole human race. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son for whomsoever. The Lord on the glorious cross had won this victory for everyone that has ever lived on this planet. The pardon has been won. 
The pardon is there. The pardon is available. It doesn't have to be worked upon. It doesn't have to be sought. It has to be believed in. And the Lord Jesus Christ has already won the pardon. And the greatest reason why people are going to be lost forever is because they simply said no to the pardon. This message in Revelation is saying that the family of God entrusted with the great truths for the end time the family of God will understand the gospel and be moved by the gospel so much that they will be compelled to share this glorious gospel with the world and go to men and women and kindly and gently and lovingly say to them, you have already got a pardon available through Jesus Christ. All that Jesus asks is that you believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, but the Lord has made the provision to overcome that great defect in the human history of this world. And all it takes is belief. No one will be lost because they're a sinner. They will be lost because they rejected free pardon. It's wonderful to belong to the family of God. Especially when the family of God have a passion for the cross of Jesus Christ. Can I say, and I don't think you have the problem in New Zealand, I don't like being part of the family of God when the family of God have forgotten the cross and the family of God have become judgmental and critical of each other. The Lord has entrusted to the family of God and we're to belong to the family of God and it is exciting and it is beautiful and it's enriching is when the people of God begin to look away from themselves and they look to the lovely Saviour that has saved them and the excitement and the glory of that salvation is the passion and the burning in their soul. And this is why God has said, I don't need to reveal my glory. Because when my people understand the glory of the cross, and when my people love the cross, and when the people are absorbed by the cross, and they can't stop talking and singing about the cross, and they just absolutely know that joy and that inexpressible joy, then the glory of the Lord shines forth. When my people know the wisdom of God through the cross, and the glories and the riches of redemption, then my people will be able to reflect the wonder of the wisdom of God. And when my people understand the beauty of the story of salvation, and the great rejoicing and the great thrill is there within the family of God because of what Jesus has done, then I will be able to win the world if it were possible for the, the kingdom of God, says our Father, through the family of God. It's wonderful to belong to the family of God. God continues with this wonderful message for the end time. And he says, when the family of God preach the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, not because they ought to, but because they can't do anything else, Jesus will return in great power and in great glory. He then goes on and he's entrusted another dynamic to the family of God. And to me, it's a beautiful dynamic. He said, tell the word, world to fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment is come. My friends, I don't know whether I can express myself adequately at this point. The hour of his judgment is come. 
suddenly we're talking about something that seems to be fearsome. Suddenly we're talking about something that seems to be awesome. Something where accountability comes in. And we begin to get all these problems where we begin to talk about will we make it? Will we be ready? Will our lives be clean enough? Will our lives be holy enough? All these questions are worth discussing and they have theological overtones and they're worth the discovering. But at the end of the day, the wonderful thing about the judgment is it is not primarily the judgment of the saints, it is his judgment, the Lord Jesus Christ. I suggest to you tonight that when you turn to the book of Daniel and you go to Daniel chapter 7, and as you look at Daniel chapter 7, you see the great court scene there. And you remember that in that great court scene where you have the glorious throne of God, where you have that great manifestation of power, suddenly the most important ele element of the judgment comes to light and that element is not the saints, it is the Son of God. And the Son of God comes before the Father and as he comes before the Father, he is judged to be worthy to take the kingdoms of this world. The judgment is primarily to declare Jesus Christ worthy. The judgment is primarily to de declare Jesus Christ victorious. The judgment is uh, primarily to declare that Jesus truly has the right to be worshipped and be considered King of kings and Lord of lords. And the point where the saints come in, once Christ has shown that he is worthy to take the kingdoms of this world, then Christ in that passage in Daniel, he turns round and he hands the kingdom over to the saints, to the family of God. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting for one minute that we don't have to stand before God in judgment. But the primary purpose of the judgment is to declare Jesus Christ victorious. And Jesus Christ is going to gain that victory through holding before the Father and holding before the worlds and holding before all that look the wonderful family of God who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. And that family is the joy of Christ's ministry through that judgment. And he turns and he hands over the kingdom to the family of God. And they will be together forever and ever. It's wonderful to belong to the family of God. Because through the family of God, God is going to reveal his glory. God is revealing his wisdom. God is revealing the glories of the cross. And God is going to, through the family, declare his Son righteous, holy, King of kings and Lord of lords. The final phase of this wonderful message entrusted to the family of God at the end of time is that beautiful message, the call for the world to worship him that made the heaven and the earth. You know, I find it very offensive, the theories of the origin of life on this planet. I'm choosing my words carefully. I find it offensive. It's not just an argument against scientific viewpoints. I find it deeply offensive. And I believe the scientific ideas that are abounding about the origins of the planet and the origins of the people on this planet, they're not just a scientific statement. They are a mocking of God himself. God said, man is made in the image of God. The scientists say, man is made in the image of a monkey. What is being said? God is being made, or a monkey is being made out of God. 
if we have originated from the ape and we are made in the image of God, do I have to spell it out any more? This is why I find it deeply offensive. It's not just the scientific argument. It's an attack on God. It's a mockery of God. And it is a debasing and a basing of God. And this is why I believe one of the reasons why God has asked the world and the family of God to turn to him at the end and worship him as the creator. Worship him as the one that gave the origin of life. Worship him who created all things and who is the beginning of all things and give him the praise and give him the glory. But there's something even more wonderful in this wonderful message that is entrusted to the family of God. Let me explain by going to Deuteronomy chapter 5. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, we have the repetition of the Ten Commandments at the time when the children of Israel are now going to go into the Promised Land. They've done their wanderings, and as they're about 40 years or more, have been wandering around the desert, they're about to go into the Promised Land, and the Ten Commandments are repeated. Have you ever noticed that in Deuteronomy chapter 5, in the Sabbath commandment, there is no mention of creation? Let me read it to you. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord God has commanded you. Six days shall you labor, and then it goes through with all the family and the ox and the rest of it. And then in verse 15 it says, Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Friends, do you realize what God is doing? He's saying to the family of God, who are going to be reflectors of the glory of God, to go and to be reflectors of the wisdom of God to the whole universe, who are going to be reflectors of the wonderful truths that are to be preached to prepare the world for the coming of Jesus. And he says, I want you to go out and tell the world to worship the him that made the heaven and the earth and to worship him that make heaven and the earth, we're called to keep his glorious Sabbath day holy. But here in Deuteronomy, it is saying that you do not worship on the Sabbath day because of the creation. You worship on the Sabbath day because I, your God, rescued you with an outstretched hand. Critics have looked at this and said the Bible can't be trusted. Forty years later, after the tables of stone written on Mount Sinai, the Bible has now got it wrong, forgotten about the creation. My friends, I believe with a passion, absolutely not. God is saying to the family of God on earth, he is saying something so simple but so very, very beautiful. He's saying you can't worship me as the creator until you worship me as the redeemer. You can't worship me until you have come to the place of recreation in your life. Then you can worship me as the creator. In other words, the Sabbath is to the glory of the Lord for the family of God. Inasmuch that the family of God keep the Sabbath because the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Absolutely. But also because the Lord with an outstretched hand reached down and rescued his people. The children of Israel were told that they had to go and paint over the doorposts of their home the shed blood of lambs. And then on that glorious Exodus day, before there was a Sinai, before the law of God was given, the people began to march out under the shedding of blood 
and the people were redeemed by the symbol of the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And the people rejoiced that night as they walked out saved by the blood. And the people of God and the family of God have been entrusted with this glorious message. Yes, preach. But God created the world in six days. Go and preach the glorious message of the wonderful Sabbath day and the wonderful blessings. But never forget that also the Sabbath is a symbol of recreation as well as creation. In other words, the family of God are entrusted with this powerful message and it is wonderful to belong to the family of God. My grandfather was enlisted in to the army, the British army, for the First World War. He was constricted, he had to do it. There were no conscientious objective privileges for him. And so he went into the army and the first week it came through to the Sabbath day. And he went up to the officers on the Friday and he said to the officers, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and the Sabbath day is very precious to me. It's precious because it's a symbol to me of the redemption the Lord has wrought through his blood. And it's a symbol to me that he is the Lord of all, the Creator. I wish to have Sabbath privileges. The officer looked at him and said, Elias, no, sir. You turn up for your responsibilities on that day. The Sabbath came round and my grandfather stayed in his barrack room. They held a court martial and they arrested my grandfather and they tried him and they condemned him to the firing squad. They told him that Monday morning that on the following Sunday he would be shot. All week he wrote letters to his family. He told my grandmother how much he loved her. He told the grandmother, please tell the children how much I love them. And then finally, on the Saturday night, in his barrack room, people in that prison came to him and hugged him and gave him, a, tried to encourage him. And on the Sunday morning, he was taken into the barracks. He was taken down into the yard. And his hands was tied behind him. And a scarf was put round his neck. And he was left standing there for two hours. Oh, praise be to God. They did not shoot my grandfather. <laughs> they were just testing him. But my grandfather did not know that. As part of the family of God, for a passion for these wonderful things that God has entrusted to the family of God, he'd rather die than be unfaithful to these wonderful truths that God has placed in the family of God. It's wonderful to be part of the family of God. Because... It's where the glory of the Lord is in the world. It's because it's where the wisdom of the Lord is in the world. It's because it's where the message for the pre pre excuse me, preparation of the people for the coming of Jesus is. The church is united when it loves the family of God and when it loves the things that God loves in the family. I said my message was simple, and it is. It's wonderful to belong to the family of God. Amen.